Inside your bulletin, you should find a page of notes with the outline that we'll be going over this day. And before we do, let's pray. Father, we do thank you that we have no need to fear in any of our trials, in any of our sufferings. It is you that works all things after the counsel of your will. It is you who has promised that you work all things together for good for those who love you and have been called according to your purpose. And so though we will undoubtedly not know the ins and the outs of situations that we face on a daily basis, we do know you. Help us to know you more and to trust you more. Let us know your plan for us. Let us know Christ. Fill us with your spirit toward that end. Satisfy us with your love and kindness, we pray. In Christ. Amen. We're only here for a short time. It's momentary, Scripture tells us. Although it feels much longer than it is, we notice as we grow older how time seems to speed up. And one question that comes up in the Christian life often is, how do I discern and live God's will? What's God's will for my life? And before we jump right into that, I want us to think about the temporariness of of the time that we have here on this earth. Because it's only but a few more fleeting moments, and then you and I who are in Christ will be breathing in heaven's air. Have you ever thought about that? There is a point in time, steady and fixed, where we will breathe in heaven's air. Picture that in your mind. Picture the light shining, pure and clean. Because there is no sun anymore. It's so perfect, and it's so bright, that there's not even shadows. It's a radiance that's resplendent all over. And even as we just sang about, the ground that our feet will tread on will be made of gold and riches on the ground. Riches that many of us labor and toil for accumulating in this life. But when we're standing there, breathing in heaven's air, standing on gold, how can we not be reminded of how little value it is? If you remember Solomon's kingdom, silver was considered to have no value because it was so wealthy. Worry, fear, distress, hardship, all of those will just be a distant memory. Our aches, our infirmities in these bodies will all be perfectly healed. Sin and all its allurements will have already departed. Never again will we have to struggle and doubt our salvation. Never again will we have to confess and repent of our sins. Never again will tears blur our eyes because of this sin that we committed against God. Our garments will be so clean, they will refract the light of Christ's glory. Never again will we bear the pain of persecution and broken relationships. Because there will be no immoral people. Think about it. There will be no idolaters in heaven. There will be no liars in heaven. No false teachers, no heretics, no cowards, no hypocrites. And we will see the Lord Jesus Christ with our own eyes. We will see him with our own eyes. We will touch him with our own hands. Think about how our hearts 
will overflow on that determined day together with one another in the physical presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. We will be holy through and through. We will be happy as we've never been before. And it will last as it's never lasted before. Because we will be eternally with the one whom our soul loves. The fountain of life. The Lord Jesus Christ. Picture it in your mind, loved ones. And treasure it in your heart, faithful Christians. More sure than I'm standing here before you today, that day will come. And in just a few short moments, we will breathe in heaven's air. And that's always been part of the plan. God chose us in Christ to be holy and blameless before him. And we've seen that in Ephesians 1.4. We were sovereignly and freely chosen, elected by God for God. Christ purchased us with his blood to the end that he would present us holy and blameless before the Father. He purchased us. He sent his spirit so that we would be born again, so that we would be regenerated, so that we would be holy. And by that same spirit, we are sealed. We cannot lose it. By that same spirit, we are indwelt. He comes to abide within us. And by that same Spirit, we are motivated. It's the Holy Spirit. And He makes us holy. But the sad thing is, unless we're intentional, how often do we forget that God is holy? He is holy, holy, holy. His moral purity is undiluted to where he is in a category of his own. His holiness doesn't wax and wane. He's not more holy one day or at one moment than another. But we don't always see it. It's never changing, but at times it looks different to us because we don't look for it. When Isaiah sees the pre-incarnate Christ seated on the throne in chapter 6, he says, he hears, holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That's a beautiful passage. We see and to the superlative degree, God's holiness, that intrinsically, essentially, in what God is, He is holy, 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 supremely beautiful in every regard. And for those who have eyes to see, we behold and cherish that beauty. This majestic holiness shines forth that transcendent beauty of God in all His perfections. And when that is beheld, when that is seen, when it is tasted and experienced, we call that glory. Because there's a, a weighty majesty to it. As if when you're in the presence of someone grand, noble, and just their countenance and their presence has, has weight to it. We see the glory of his love, the glory of his power, the glory of his truth, the glory of his goodness, the glory of his justice. All of these attributes of God's are so beautifully resplendent because of his holiness. And every single person Every single created thing that God calls into relationship with himself are likewise required to be holy. And it's not a wonder, since if we read through the Bible, we see what? His name is holy. Leviticus 20, verse 3. His word is holy. Psalm 105, verse 42. His arm 
by which he acts is holy. Psalm 98 verse 1. Anything that has any relation to God in his service is holy. Even locations are considered holy. Places where he sets his name. Mount Moriah. Mount Zion. Jerusalem. All the same place where Abraham took Isaac in obedience by faith, trusting that God would be able to bring him back from the dead. And God stays Abraham's hand on that mountain. And then centuries later, on that same mountain, Christ is crucified. And that is why we say, Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh will provide. On the mountain, it will be provided. And just in small fashion, it was provided through a ram for Abraham, but that was looking towards something much greater. Not just the salvation of Isaac, but the salvation of all God's people in Christ. We see that times are holy. Clothing is holy. The law is holy. Offerings are holy. How much more ought his people? All of these inanimate things are set apart as holy unto God. We are called a holy nation. But are we holy? We're going into this new year and everybody likes to make resolutions they know they're not going to keep. But if you were to take the marks of a Christian, distinguishing marks of saving faith, and compare them with your goals this coming new year, how do they line up? What have you planned? Do you desire to be more holy? As we went through 1 Peter in the summer, we saw this in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your conduct because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. He doesn't say some of your conduct. He doesn't even say most of your conduct. He says what? All. All your conduct. Moreover, we also see that there is this requirement of holiness, a requirement not just of our conduct, but of our being, of our person, of who we are. And there's a level and there's a standard of holiness, a threshold of holiness. Hebrews 12 says, pursue, it's a command, pursue the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Now we know this holiness is not anything that we can achieve. This holiness is not anything we can earn. We, we can't accomplish it in and of ourselves. Even if we try, we can't do it from the right heart unless we are united to Christ. We have to be united to Christ because Christ himself is our sanctification. Christ is our sanctification. Think about this. From the depths of eternity, God intricately devises a plan, a singular plan, to illuminate His own divine glory through the manifestation of His Son. That's the big picture plan. That's the crux of all creation finds its purpose in this radiant glory of God. And it's revealed in the face of Christ, His beloved Son. And, and we tend to get this wrong so often. And we see flashing across our YouTube pages other churches and teachers that get this wrong. Because salvation of humanity is encompassed within this grand design. But it's crucial for us to recommend that's not the goal. 
That's, that's a cog. That's a part of it. It's a piece in God's overarching economy of self-glorification. Does that bother you? That God is for God before He's for any single person. That He is committed to His own holiness and to His own glory. And you would think, that's selfish. And that's because you either have a wicked heart or you're extremely ignorant. God is for God. And He calls us to worship Him. Because He's the only Holy One. He's the only pure One. There's none like Him. He is the greatest being. There is no being comparable to Him. And if He were to call us to worship any other being other than Himself, He would be calling us to idolatry. He'd be calling us to some lesser thing. And remember also that God is triune. Father, Son, and Spirit. So there has always eternally been existing this love relationship in glory between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it becomes evident to us that in the entirety of salvation, meticulously orchestrated prior to the inception of the world and safe from the evil feeble clutches of man's will, God devised a plan, apart from any counsel, apart from any aid. He had a plan for the magnification of His glory. And if you actually think about it, this is good news for us. This is actually really good news for us, because God's desire for His own glory provides a complete salvation for sinners. He's not going to change his plan for you or for me. It's not going to be altered one bit. And the beauty in this plan for us is our union with Christ. Our union with Christ. Because this is, this is how we have life. If we're not united to Christ... We don't have life. And this union with Christ has a pre-time aspect to it. Look with me at 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy 1. Verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of either the witness about our Lord or me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose, singular, and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus when... Literally, from before times eternal. We, we can't even comprehend that with our time-bound, finite mind. But now, verse 10, has been manifested by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. We, we also see our union with Christ in time, representatively. And we've spent a good deal of time going through Romans chapter 5. You're either in Adam or you're in Christ. Those are the only camps. Every single one of us is born under Adam. Born in our transgressions and in our sins. And we have to be taken from there and united to Christ. And we also see aspects of our union with Christ in time and eternity in the vitality of that relationship, in the life-giving of that relationship. If you think about 
This is why we're called members of the body. How long will a member of your body live if it's removed from the body? Not long. Slowly withers and dies. Or a branch in a vine. As the Lord himself said, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. Or look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 30. But by his doing, that's telling you the source of it. God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus. Who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. We could spend weeks and weeks on just these two verses. It is so glorious, so rich, so deep. It's God's doing you're in Christ Jesus. And because of that, Christ becomes wisdom to us. Now, is it a wise thing to repent of your sins and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation? Yes. But we don't know that until we've been united to Christ. We can see it. Intellectually, even, we can grasp a lot of these things. You you could know for certain, with a historical faith, that at one point in time you're going to die, and you're going to go either to be with Christ or to await judgment, ultimately to be cast into a lake of fire. And that the only means of salvation is Jesus Christ. You can believe that. But still, inside, your affections and your desires are drawn towards sin. And so you'll give lip service, but you're never fully committed. And so as we bring this together, we see that it's God's will that His elect not every single person, be united to Christ, and He will accomplish His good purpose. What else do we see regarding the will of God? Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And just for those of you that have been taught Americanisms, um, The Lord is not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Break that down, number one, in its context. And then when you look at it in Greek, it's very clear. The Lord is not slow, as some count slowness, but he's patient towards you. Who's the you? In the previous verse, it's beloved. Who are the beloved? He tells you at the beginning of the epistle. Those who have a faith the same kind as ours. The Lord is patient towards you, we could say, beloved, not willing that any, that's a pronoun that goes back to you and beloved, not willing that any of you should perish, but that all, another pronoun that goes back to any, that goes back to you, that goes back to beloved, that goes back to those who have a faith the same kind as ours, all should come to repentance. And what you see is, just as God was faithful with Noah, in delivering him and his family. He didn't send the rains before he finished the ark. At the appointed time, the rain came. God's not going to have Christ return and bring about a new era until that last sinner for that era repents. We don't know who they are. We don't know who that is. But we do know that the number of people is either odd or even. I find that helpful because it gives a finiteness to it. And you never know, the next person you evangelize could be that person that the Lord, in his sovereign timing, is waiting for 
that person saved, now we kick off the next sequence. That's a motivation for evangelism. But here in 1 Thessalonians 4, as he's beginning to sum things up, he says, finally then, brothers, we ask and exhort you in the Lord Jesus, see that union with Christ language again, that as you received from us as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. What's the will of God for my life? For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Your being made holy. Now let's look over at Ephesians, our favorite book. But let's, before we get back to chapter 2, verse 10, let's go to chapter 4 and see if there's some semblance of familiarity here with 2, 1 through 10, starting in 4, 17. And the Spirit says through the Apostle Paul, Therefore this I say and testify in the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their mind, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you heard him and were taught in him, just as the truth is in Jesus, you were heard and taught what? To lay aside, in reference to your former conduct, the old man, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and to put on the new man, which in the likeness of God, notice this, has been created. That's our same word from chapter 2, verse 10. This is the creation that only God does. Created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. We're getting towards a lifestyle, a walking. And he's going to go in great depths explaining this when we get to chapter 4 and following. But in verse 10, you remember, he's explaining why there's no boasting in 8 and 9. And 8 and 9 are explaining what's going on in verse 5. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. That's uniting us to Christ. And that is by grace, through faith, and that salvation and that grace and that faith are a gift of God, an effectual gift of God, so that we don't have any ground for boasting. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Now, have you ever wondered in trying to discern and live God's will for your life, have you ever wondered what constitutes good works? I have. How do I know if I'm doing good works? It says they're prepared beforehand, but I didn't get an email. I didn't get a letter. I didn't get a, a, a ping on my phone, a push notification, but it's all in here. So what are good works? There are three conditions, three conditions that are necessary to constitute a man's work as being good in God's sight. Now, when we're talking about good works, we're not talking horizontally, societally. There's a lot of philanthropy that can be done. You could send money over to build a well in Africa. And horizontally, that's a good work. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about something before God. Because if we remember Isaiah 64, 6, the Lord's indictment is all your righteous deeds, all your best works, the, the, the cream of the cream, the finest things you've ever done. 
apart from and outside of Christ, presented to God are filthy rags. It's like going to a really nice car dealership. You're going to go get a Rolls Royce or a Lamborghini, and you're going to try and pay the person with your dirty underwear. And so we're going to look at these in practical terms. What are the three conditions? I've listed them there for you. Number one is the mandate. The mandate, it must be commanded by God. It must be commanded by God for it to be a good work. Number two, the mainspring. It must proceed from true faith. And number three, the motive. It must be directly aimed at the glory of God. If only two of these things are present in any given work that we do, it's not a good work. This is the bare minimum. These three must be present. Otherwise, the work that we do is not considered a good work. And remember, these works are not meritorious. We're not earning anything. It's not, well, yeah, you did, you did a lot of good works, um, but you didn't quite get enough to make it into heaven. Because remember, this goes back to before the foundation of the world, with the plan that God had in uniting his people to Christ. This is, these good works are a fruit of justification, a fruit of regeneration, not a root to it. It doesn't add anything to our justification. We don't get more or less justified, more or less regenerated based on our good works. But the individual who has true saving faith will always have good works. And our works are going to be imperfect. Our works are going to be imperfect. But we have a high priest who mediates and intercedes for us, and they are sanctified because of Christ, who, remember, is our sanctification. Now, let's look at this first one. The mandate, it must be commanded by God. There's one lawgiver, there's one king, there's one judge. And every single one of us in this room is going to face that judge when we die. Every single person outside of this room is going to face that judge when they die. And it's his law that we are to follow. If we were living in a different country, we'd have to abide by the laws of that country, which might be different. We can't just go over to England and start driving on what we would consider the right side of the road and then say, no, you don't get it. I'm American, though. We do things different. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, all its fullness, everything belongs to God. There is no authority except from God, and he's given a law. And consider this, that sin isn't just falling short of God's glory. But First John tells us sin is lawlessness. First John 3, 4. Sin is lawlessness. And many people, unfortunately, many people will die confident that their next breath is going to be breathing in heaven's air, only to hear, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice what? Lawlessness, same word. Sin is lawlessness. We, we have to get this. There's a battle raging for your soul. Now, Satan knows doctrine much better than we do. He knows that those that are in, truly in Christ are secure. But that doesn't mean that we can't shame Christ with our sin. And that doesn't mean that everybody that professes the name of Christ is even a Christian. So in some sense, he still wins people back because they were never truly believers. There's a battle raging for our souls. Think about that. The gravity of it. A little misplaced affections. A little misplaced time. Not a big deal, right? A little worldly wisdom mixed with God's wisdom. A little pride. A little laziness. A little indulgence. And then you wake up at the end of your life, 
broken and ashamed because of everything that you squandered when Christ gave you so much. Or worse, you were deceived and you wake up in hell. You only have one soul. Just one. Pretty much anything else that you have, apart from that one soul, time, you can get back. But so many people base their soul's destiny on the commands of men. Trusting this or that teacher. You shouldn't even trust me 100%. Because I'm a sinner too. You should go back to Scripture. Our only infallible rule of faith. Because whoever's giving you spiritual advice has the potential to be the most dangerous person in your life. Because if they're wrong and you believe it, who pays for it? You do. Sure, they have increased condemnation, but that doesn't help you when you're condemned too. That's not a comfort. I was hoping to go to heaven, totally thought I was going to go to heaven too, but this guy deceived me. You know, my only saving glory though is while I'm in hell, he's got a worse spot in hell than I do. That's no benefit. So I want to test this with you guys. Most of you have paper and something to write with. And so here we go. I want to test you in just one category of required obedience. The church. The doctrine of the church. Can you write down what a church is? What's a church? I'll give you some helps. What are the marks that must be present in order for it to be a church? I'll give you one hint. If they don't faithfully practice biblical church discipline, they're not a church. If they have a woman pastor... They're not a church. What must be contained in a worship service? What are the elements of a worship service? Who is permitted to join the church? Who's permitted to join the church? Who's permitted to oversee the church? What does authority look like in the church? Now, this is really just a very, very basic doctrine of the church, answering these questions. And if you don't know what to look for, if you don't know what a church is, how do you know what to look for when you go and you visit a church? What metric are you using to measure whether or not it's a good church? If you don't even know biblically what a church is. And the irony about you being that kind of person that's looking for a church that doesn't even know what a church is. The irony of that is that countless men have been executed for holding to a biblical doctrine of what the church is. And that's the reason we have this country, America. And that's the reason that we have the First Amendment in this country. What was Jesus' view of this ignorance? He rebuked it. This is what he says in Matthew 15. You invalidated the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites. Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. In vain do they worship me, in emptiness they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commands of men. Oh, you don't have to do this. Oh, you have to do this. Indeed, this isn't just a danger within the church. Fathers, 
Mothers, this is a danger within the family too. In Ezekiel 20, the Lord says, I said to their children in the wilderness, do not walk in the statutes of your fathers. Do not walk in the statutes of your fathers. And do not keep their judgments. And do not defile yourselves with their idols. I am Yahweh your God. Walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. Fathers, do you labor to teach your children the truth? Are you a watchman for your family? Even if you don't have any kids yet, but you're married, you have a family. Are you a watchman? Do you pray for the soul of your wife? Children, you're not exempt either. Do you yourselves labor for the truth yourself? Because your soul depends on it. As much as your parents love you, they can't save you. As much as they wish they could, they can't. It's a narrow path, and it's a narrow gate, and it's single file, one by one. So we have to be able to say, as it's written in Isaiah, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because they have no dawn. They don't even have the hints of the beginning of light. It's all darkness. We must labor to know the Lord. Paul in Colossians speaks of this too when he says that these commands and teachings of men that aren't derived from Scripture, that form this kind of pseudo-Christianity, what we would probably call a denomination nowadays, and a lot of different denominations, not all of them, he calls it this in their appearance of wisdom, in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. Verse 23 of chapter 2. Self-made religion is literally will worship. Will worship. Worship that seems best to your own free will. Well, I think we should, I feel like we should do it this way. I feel like God's okay with that. I feel like God wants me to do this. How do you know? If it's not commanded in Scripture, how do you know? It's just will worship. Our worship must be commanded in His Word. Our prayers have to be according to His Word. Our works have to be according to His Word. No longer are we going to live like the Gentiles, like we used to be, with our feelings and our imaginations and our thoughts and our contrivances, but with Scripture, and Scripture alone as the authority. This is where discernment is needed. Because discernment is not just saying right and wrong. Discernment is, they both look right. How do I know? And it's not as if, well, I figured that one out, and so that's done. Cool. Because we live in a real context. There's different people, different situations, different arguments, different feelings that we're experiencing in our bodies. What's obedience look like in this situation? Because the one that I have at 1045 today is going to be different than the one that I have at 245 today. We have to learn that remembering is our responsibility. It's our responsibility to remember. It's not just, oh man, I forgot God. Sorry. He calls us to remember. Remembering is an act of worship. Remembering is something that we are to be proactive in. This is what he says in Numbers 15. You'll remember this. And it shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of Yahweh so as to do them and not follow after your own heart and your own eyes, after which you played the harlot, so that you may remember to do all my commandments and be holy to your God. 
King Saul followed his own ideas and thoughts and his own heart, and he lost the kingdom. Uzzah, with the best intentions, followed his own thoughts and ideas and his own heart, and he lost his life. And some of you here have experienced such sweet fellowship with Christ. You've had refreshing seasons of seeing the Lord's faithfulness and experiencing His his closeness. You know that God's omnipresent, but you know those times when this is different. Not only do do I intellectually know, but it's as if I can feel His presence in the room with me now. Like when you're reading through a gospel and the strangest thing happens, you're reading about Jesus and you realize he's present with you at that very moment. But now your heart feels cold. You long for that, but but you don't have it and your heart is cold and lifeless and you long, God, draw near again. Jesus speaks to this. In Matthew 24, he says, because lawlessness is multiplied, most people's love will grow cold. That's the first place that we should be looking. We should be going to the Lord and saying, I know that my heart grows cold because of my sin, my lawlessness. Reveal that to me, Lord, that I might confess, repent, and be forgiven And so I want to ask you here today, who are here by God's providence and not by accident, do you follow the law of God? Do you follow the law of God? Not to earn anything, not to merit salvation, but is that a pattern in your life, a priority in your life? You Seek to follow the law of God because you desire to be pleasing to Him. Not because you're going to earn salvation, but because you love your Father. And your Father's commanded it, and He's given you these commands for your good. Paul reminds us in Romans 12, Therefore I exhort you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a sacrifice, living, holy, and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may approve what the will of God is, that which is good and pleasing and perfect. Now, the temptation you're going to experience, if you haven't already, and if you have, you'll experience it again, is to become really good Pharisees. Just learning the Bible faking it till you make it, following the commands like Paul did before he was saved. All externals. Your mindset is, your motto is, what's the minimum amount of work I can do and still pass? And and it usually manifests itself like this. Well, it's not sin. I can do it. It's not sin. And what you're doing is you're saying, okay, where's the line of sin? All right, how close can I get to it without actually crossing it? Is that a heart that's set upon God? No. Rather than saying, okay, what does glorifying God look like in this situation? Because that's what I want to pursue. Those will never be good works if you're saying, what's the minimum I can do and still pass? Second, the mainspring. It must proceed from true faith. It must proceed from true faith. What's a mainspring? In a clock, in a clock that you wind, not an electronic one, the mainspring is fundamental to the operation. You don't have a mainspring. You've just got a very expensive chunk of metal and glass. When the mainspring is wound up, the energy is stored within the clock. When the energy is released, the clock operates. And its movement, even, with all the gears inside, is regulated by the mainspring. And this is very similar to the way our faith operates. 
So not only must the work be commanded by God if it's going to be good, a good work must also proceed from this true faith, a living faith that God has given. Ephesians 2.8 is the mainspring of our good works. Just like in a clock, the mainspring has to be wound by the outside. The clock doesn't wind itself. So we've seen in Ephesians 1 and in Ephesians 2 that it's the power of God that effectually initiates this mainspring of our faith within it, within us, and then He preserves it by His grace. And have you ever noticed that God doesn't give us grace for tomorrow today? He gives us the grace when we need it. And from our perspective, sometimes it's like the last moment, and then it's there. But all of this flows from the merits and the intercessory work of Jesus Christ. So we're still not meriting anything. It's all of Christ. Look with me at Titus 2. This is a beautiful passage. And as I was translating it, something struck me, figuratively. Titus 2.11, For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men. Let's pause there. What's the word for? Because. So, it's explaining something, right? What's he explaining? He's explaining this mandate for all these different kinds of men to live these holy lives in 2, 1 to 10. Grace. This is the force behind that we were just talking about in the mainspring. It's the force behind the holy life summed up by God's saving act in the Lord Jesus Christ. This grace not only works faith, justification, but also sanctification. And it's ongoing. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. And then this is the part that struck me. Bringing salvation. Literally, it's just saving. It's one word. It's saving, not bringing, just saving. That's interesting, isn't it? Put this in your back pocket for when you're having one of those conversations with an Arminian. For the grace of God has appeared saving all men. All means all, right? So that's universalism. Every single person is saved. So why are we even here? Why am I even talking? What's the point of making any kinds of appeals? Unless all doesn't always mean all without exception. It could also mean all without distinction. And we use this in our normal language. For the love of money is the root of all evil. It's the same setup. But we recognize it's not all without exception. It's all without distinction. So we translate it all kinds of evil. This is the way this is supposed to be translated. All kinds of men. Because what's he just got done explaining? All of these different mandates that men are supposed to follow. You have older men, older women, younger men, younger women. You have slaves. All different kinds of men. Now, it's not universalism. It's all different kinds. But look at what verse 12 says. Instructing us that, denying ungodliness and worldly desires, we should live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. This word for instructing is child training. It's disciplining. So what's instructing us here? God's grace. God's grace is the one doing the act. He's instructing us by His grace. And what does this grace instruct us to do? To repent and to believe. With the focus being more on the faith side. You see it there? Denying ungodliness and worldly desires, turning away from them. We should live sensibly, trusting in Christ. It's one movement. Turning away from sin is not enough. We also have to put on the righteous counterpart. Verse 13. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we're looking forward to, 
this blessed, this happy, this happy hope, this appearing, same word as we see in 11, the grace of God has appeared. So we see God's grace has appeared in the incarnation of Christ, and God's glory will appear that we should be looking forward to at the second coming of Christ. And then note this beautiful, what's called Granville Sharp's rule, God and Savior, same person, Jesus Christ. He's both God and Savior. And what did he do? Verse 14, he gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all lawlessness and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. The God-man comes himself in the flesh on behalf of his people, and he comes and he redeems us from lawlessness, what we've already looked at, same word, to purify this people belonging to him, to make them holy, what exactly we've been talking about. And it's not just good works, is it? But there's a zeal for them, zealous for good works. I want this. I'm desiring this. And don't let us neglect and miss and forget the fact that it's God's grace. It's God's grace that's saving and sanctifying, and it's doing that in Christ. So our labor cannot be separate from the grace of God. And this is the constant testimony of Scripture. God works His works in us. That's how they're good works. They're according to the command of God in Scripture, and they're done by the faith which God supplies by grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about John chapter 3, Jesus and Nicodemus. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and does not come to the light lest his deeds be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been done by God. Did you ever catch that in John 3? One group of people comes to the light so that the light will shine on their work so that it's clear that they're going to last because it's God that's worked them in the individual, having been done by God. Now, many professing Christians deny that salvation is all of grace. How do you avoid boasting? Now, most of them won't go so far as to say it's by works. They want to try and find some kind of middle ground between God and man. But this shows shame and disdain for God and for his works. Consider even the promise of the new covenant all the way back in Ezekiel 36. God says, I will put my spirit within you, and I will cause you to walk in my statutes, and then you will be careful to do my judgments. Let's look at Romans chapter 1. because This is going to be illuminating for us as well. Romans 1, 15. Remember, these glorious truths cannot be understood by the natural man. You probably even remember in yourself when you didn't see these things. And then one day the Lord flicks on the light, so to speak, and you're like, man, this is on every page. How did I miss this? But the natural man cannot grasp these. They're foolishness. But we can agree with Paul here. Look what he says in verse 15. In this way, for my part, I'm eager to proclaim the gospel to you who are also in Rome. Eager, joyfully ready, desirous to serve. 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He's saying the gospel is the power of God. The gospel is what does the work. That's interesting, because we think we have to do the work. But he's saying, no, 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 built into this gospel, which is why it's called the power of God, is the grace, faith, salvation. And it's implanted by the Spirit of God. And over time, you see the differences in growth between wheat and tares. We get tripped up over things. Everyone who believes, that phrase, everyone who believes. A lot of people say, it's whosoever will. No, that's not what it is. It's literally the believing ones or those who are believing. It's a present abiding faith. And God is not just saving Jews here, he's saving Gentiles. And we would call that the world. Jews and Gentiles, all people. 17, 
For in it, what's it? The gospel. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous shall live by faith. The righteousness of God is revealed in act and operation. God freely causing people to be righteous in Christ. We see that later down down the road in 517. It's God's power at work in sinful man. And we, you know, you see here, it's written. He's quoting. He's quoting from the Old Testament. Where is he quoting from? Habakkuk 2.4, which reads, Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. And so we see in Habakkuk this contrast between judge, impending doom and judgment coming and then salvation which is also how Paul lays out Romans, because what happens in verse 18? Impending doom and judgment, because the wrath of God is being revealed presently. And then there's this contrast in this specific verse, Habakkuk 2.4, between pride and faith. The prideful man's soul is corrupt. Jeremiah 13, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? then you also can do good who are accustomed to doing evil. A little bit of sarcasm in there. Or to consider this one, Proverbs 27. Though you pound an ignorant fool into a mortar with a pestle, in the midst of crushed grain, his folly will not turn aside from him. You ever felt like that? I, I love this person so much, I wish I could just beat this truth into them. But that's, it's not the problem. The problem's not... The intellect. The problem's in the soul. The problem is the heart. They need a new heart. They need a new soul. They have to be made, created, new creatures in Christ. But, in the contrast, the righteous man lives by his faith. And if we bring out what's in Habakkuk 2.4, it's really helpful. Go read Habakkuk. It's really short. Go read it later today. It would read like this. Behold, as for the proud one, with respect to the vision, to the revelation of Yahweh about the judgment that was just spoken of in context, his soul is not right within him after receiving that revelation and seeing it because he refuses to submit and to change anything because of what's being revealed. And so he's going to undergo judgment. But the righteous will live by the faithfulness of Yahweh through Yahweh's revelation. He has a redeemed soul. He's going to receive lasting joy because he's going to hear and submit to the word of Yahweh. And so if we sum this up, we see the truly obedient person is not the one that, that or is the one that lives each part of life trusting the faithfulness of God by following the commands of God's word over and against everything else. And we can bring some witnesses from other places. Without faith is impossible to please God. Whatever's not done from faith is sin. So where does this place you? You can't accomplish salvation. You can't even do anything that's pleasing to God apart from this faith. You're commanded to repent, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, to look unto Christ, lay down your arms, submit yourself, surrender to Him, to go to Him, throw yourself upon Him. He says, whoever comes to me, I will not cast out. Well, what if I'm not elect? That's not your department. That's not in the gospel presentation. That's something to look at after. And that's actually a great comfort. But using that as an excuse isn't going to be something by which you can do a gotcha to God on that day. The offer is open. And you're here today and you've heard it. And so now you're culpable for it. What will you do with Christ what will you do with Jesus Christ? Great teacher, interesting guy, or will you flee to him as refuge, as your hope, as your life, and throw everything upon him and say, Lord, I have nothing. I can't do anything. Somebody told me that you're the only one who saves because you lived a perfect life. 
And you died when you shouldn't have died because you never sinned. But that death was important because it was paying for the sins of others. But the grave couldn't hold you, and so you rose from the dead on the third day, defeating sin, defeating death. And your offer still stands. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And I'm weary, and I'm heavy laden with my sin. I'm weary trying to get rid of it, trying to find happiness and all these other things and trying to get rid of this guilty conscience. Only you can give rest. Please give me that rest. And that's where you sit, waiting at the foot of the cross, calling upon the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's no wonder we hear the rapture in Paul's voice when he says, I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by what? By faith. So that each thing that I do will be a good work, pleasing to the one who purchased me. So recap, the mandate must be commanded by God, the mainspring must proceed from true faith, and then finally, our last point, the motive. The motive, it must be directly aimed at the glory of God. Everything you choose in this life, everything you refuse in this life, every little or big decision must be to the glory of God. So there's no mindless living for Christians. Our Lord has said, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Not unto your glory, unto his glory, but they should be seen. And again, he says, my Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. In fact, every facet of life, even on the cover of our bulletin, whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Those are the basic mundane aspects of life, eating and drinking. But even in that, we're to do it unto the glory of God. Even in the smallest of things. You've been bought with a price. You're to glorify God with your body. If you, if you belong to Christ, you belong to Christ. Every single part. Your assets, your time, everything, your relationships, everything. You have been purchased out of the slave market of sin to be a slave of righteousness in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not your own. So, pop quiz. Based off what we've learned, is feeding a homeless person a good work? It depends. Are one, two, and three present that we just went over? Is it commanded in Scripture to care, to love our neighbor, and to care for those who are poor? Yes. Is it done by faith? Let's say that it is. Is my aim glorifying God in this? Then it's a good work. But if any one of those is missing, it's not a good work. Why? Because it, it's not self-boasting. It's self-boasting. Let's say you have the first two, but you don't have the third. It's self-boasting. You're boasting in yourself. So here's one that's going to be a little more touchy. When a man exercises faith, is it a good work? John 6, 29. This is the work of God that you believe, which is the verb form of faith. It depends. Are one, two, and three present? If not, it's self-boasting. Ephesians 5 tells us that we are to live our lives in such a way that we are striving after being pleasing to the Lord in 5.10. We were darkness and now we're light and we're to walk as children of light. That's, that's it. That's what we should be thinking. I know we've covered a lot of ground today, but think about Am I desiring to be pleasing to him? And that's going to encapsulate this because then you're going to know where to look. You're going to know that it has to be done in Christ. 
And you're going to know that the aim needs to be unto the glory of God. And even for you children who are still living in the home. Colossians 3.20. Children, obey your parents in the Lord in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. That's pleasing to him. Hebrews 13, 21, as he's summing up this letter right before he says, I've written to you this brief sermon, which is about an hour long. It's a short sermon, biblically. But in verse 21, he says, Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, our Lord Jesus, equip you in every good thing to do his will. How's he going to do that? By doing in us what is pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Our ambition, 2 Corinthians 5, 9, is to be pleasing to him in everything. God's will is the glory of his name. His name is holy. His people are to be holy. Which means if we are calling ourselves his people, our desire is also to be holy. Our desire is that he would be glorified. Therefore, our desire in everything, be pleasing to him, magnify his name. Lord, I want to magnify your name in my thoughts, in my speech, in my actions, in my friends, in my choosing, in my refusing, in my sicknesses, when I'm healthy, in my job, in my family, in my church, while I'm undergoing persecution, or while I'm receiving some blessing in all my life. And yes, Lord, especially in my death, I desire to be pleasing to you, to live a holy life so that you would be glorified. And since we can see that God's revealed his will to us in the scriptures, we can pray to him with confidence. Lord, you said in your word that I'm to be like this. I desire that too. Lord, help me to desire it consistently and help me to carry it out without mixture of any other affections or desires, but only unto your glory, only unto the glory of your great name. As we're constantly seeking the things above, right? Setting our affections on Christ, who has loved us, who has demonstrated that love. And so when an opportunity comes, when decisions come, when temptation comes, or situations are forced upon us, immediately what we have to do is pause and pray and start thinking through our course of action. What are the components involved? What is the scripture I know to be true? But before we get through into any of that, the first thing we need to think is, He loves me. He loves me, and He gave Himself for me. And in his love, he purchased me. And in his love and in his suffering, he glorified his Father. He who was rich became poor for my sake that I might become rich through him. How can I blaspheme his name right now? He loved me. He's watching. Angels in heaven are watching. Fallen angels are watching. He loves me. The God of the universe loves me and took on flesh. He was tempted. He was tortured. He was brutally murdered. He bore the wrath of God out of love for me to reconcile me to his Father so that I would be a partaker of blessings I don't deserve. He rose again. He's proven his love. He's proven his faithfulness. So how can we not be enraptured with this glorious God who has given us such great love? So then, let us be resolved because of his love towards us to live for his glory, seeking the truth from his word, seeking to operate from our union with Christ and the faith that he has given to us and sustains by his grace and for the glory of his great name, for he's worthy. Amen? Amen. Father, we come to you, Lord, thankful that your word 
that gives us everything that we need for life and godliness. Cause us to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Let us be motivated by that love that you have from us, a a love that even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let us put off all the foolish and stupid arguments that we use so quickly in our minds to justify pursuing fleshly lusts. And let us put on the mind of Christ, seeing his great love for us, and seeing the call for us to be holy. Grant us that desire as we gaze upon Christ and see his beauty to want to be like him. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.